I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the first chapter of Bradbury and Carney's Intimate Relationships book. So today we'll be discussing love and why it matters. So we'll talk about why intimate relationships are important, how they impact happiness and well-being, um, the attributes of love, uh, and things like that. But let's get started by talking about the smartest man in the world. So Albert Einstein met Maliva Merrick in 1896 when he was 17 and she was 20. And they bonded because they had a shared passion for physics and that led to affection between the two of them. Uh, Maliva became pregnant and they got married, but Einstein preferred to tutor students or hike in the Alps than spend time with her. They had a daughter and she died in infancy of scarlet fever but Einstein never told others that um, he ever had a daughter. They actually had two boys together too. And he said his son, Edward, who was the younger of the two, um, he said he wished that he had never been born because he actually um, had schizophrenia. At one point in their marriage, Einstein outlined the conditions that Maliva had to fulfill to continue with the marriage. So he said, you will not expect any intimacy from me, nor will you approach me in any way. You will stop talking to me if I request it, and you will leave my bedroom or study immediately if I request it. So this is not, uh, who would want to stay in a relationship like that? The two separated in 1914, and they got divorced in 1919. Now, he, in 1919, he married his cousin, Elsa, and he said that it was really just a marriage of convenience, that his wife managed uh, their apartment in Berlin and took care of their finances, uh, and he continued to have affairs and received gifts from other women. So that woman in the picture uh, sitting on Einstein's lap is not Elsa. So Einstein struggled in relationships, which uh, would suggest that perhaps success in relationships requires more than just intellect. Now to love and be loved are the most basic human needs and loneliness and social isolation are awful for most people. So let's learn a little bit more about why intimate relationships are important. This is a study that they did, a shocking experiment uh, with an MRI. They put women in front of, in, a, in an MRI machine, in front of a monitor, and they told them that a red X meant that they were gonna get a small shock in a blue, uh, z is that an O or a zero? We'll say it's, a, it's an O, means that they won't. And they were put into the MRI scanner in, in one of three different conditions, either holding an intimate partner's hand, holding a stranger's hand, or being all alone. And it was found that the women's brain regions governing, governing emotional and behavioral threat responses were activated less when holding a partner's hand than in either of the other two conditions. Um, it's ironic though that closeness, um, closeness is comforting to us, but uh, it also makes us vulnerable and unpleasant and extreme experiences aren't rare in intimate relationships either. So I don't wanna gloss that over. Uh, 4.8 million women and 2.9 million men are assaulted by their partners each year. How do they, in these intimate relationships, affect happiness and well-being? Well, let's talk about the term subjective well-being. And this is how happy that we feel that we are. Knowing someone's relationship status tells us something about their subjective well-being. So for example, married people report greater happiness than when compared to single divorced or widowed people, and unmarried people are happier when they're living with a partner rather than when they're living alone. Relationship quality is how good or bad people judge their relationship to be, and intimate relationships uh, impact subjective well-being more than any other domain of a person's life. So more than their work, more than their finances, and more than their hobbies. Happiness comes when couples are able to, to, to sustain a high standard of their relationship over a long period of time. And it's believed that three factor, there are three factors why relationships promote happiness. Uh, the first is that they affect our physical health. So 
they've done studies on this sort of thing and people are less likely to catch the common cold uh, if they can resolve their relationship conflicts. Uh, the body heals more quickly if you have the support of a close relationship and in relationships improve longevity because people receive more support. So they did a study on 188 patients who had congestive heart failure and people in happier relationships were more likely, uh, were less likely to die in a four year period than people who were in unhappy relationships, which I don't know, that makes, that puts a lot of pressure on people. Second thing is, sex, is sexual intimacy. People say that sex is the activity that makes them happiest day to day. Uh, no surprise there. And they report that commuting is the worst activity. That's why uh, I only get in a car maybe three times a month and I walk to work every day. It's about a seven minute walk. People with a steady partner have sex far more frequently than people who are not partnered. Uh, in unmarried couples, they have sex 90 times per year uh, versus 35 uh, times per year per, pe per people who are not uh, in a couple. And economists have estimated that the happiness maximizing number of sexual partners in a previous year is one. Uh, it just has to be the right one, apparently. Third factor is that relationships positively impact financial well-being. So economists put the value of a marriage at $100,000 a year. Uh, and I have no idea how they come up with that number because it seems very approximate. Uh, but it's believed that people who remain married accumulate more wealth. People also pay a price for relationship transitions, especially when partnerships end in things like um, divorce or when cohabitation ends. And they have found that women's household income drops 58% when they divorce and 33% uh, when they end cohabitation. People who are happier are more likely to marry than stay single. And also, happier people before marriage are less likely to divorce. And these outcomes are called selection effects because it's said to select people into certain sorts of relationships. So it's that initial happiness that leads to a better marriage and relationship. But uh, intimate relationships also provide protection effects which means that being in a committed relationship provides protection that's not available to single people or people who are cohabitating. So for example, when married people are compared to a group of similar people who remain single, depression and alcohol use declines for all those people over a seven year period, but it declines faster for people who are married. Well, it also has an impact, or intimate relationships also have an impact on the well-being of children. Relationship status of parents is more influential than race or education in determining whether children will experience poverty. So 81% of children with unmarried parents will experience poverty, and that's higher than any racial group or lack of educational attainment. Excuse me. Uh, children who are exposed to more parental disruptions tend to have more behavioral problems too and poorer health. And it's believed because there's less uh, parental supervision in those cases uh, in the home and also the risk for obesity grows. So does that mean that a child's fate is determined by their parents? No, having a divorced parent only increases your chances of divorcing by about 10 to 20% beyond the level experienced from intact families. And we'll talk about this later in the course too, but uh, the best predictor of whether a marriage lasts is the age at which you get married. You probably think that uh, your private intimate relationships are your business and don't impact others. But in fact, they do impact uh, the larger community and the greater society. Every divorce costs taxpayers approximately $30,000 in the form of welfare payments, childcare, and food assistance. And again, I don't know how they come up with a number like that. 
Social control theory explains links between intimate relationships and the broader social impact of our actions. So for example, social relationships impose limits on how, on how individuals behave with weaker relationships increasing deviant behavior. So the use of drugs, alcohol, or the commission of crimes. And this is also related to social conformity. High quality intimate relationships encourage partners to guide each other to socially sanctioned lifestyles. Intimate relationships are universal. Now I have no idea what's going on in that picture, but Jankowick and Fisher identified romantic love in the vast majority of 166 hunting, foraging, and agricultural societies that they studied. They said that romantic love is nearly universal. I think it is universal. Across 100 countries, more than 90% of people uh, have experienced some form of marriage by the time they reach their late 40s. Comparing popular love songs from the United States and China do show some differences uh, between the cultures though. North American students view love as positive and leading to personal happiness, uh, whereas the Chinese students tended to view love as enduring, but negatively tinged with infatuation and sorrow. What about if, uh, when people have, uh, if people don't have a choice about who they marry? Well, a survey of women in China, and this was over a long period of time, showed that women were more satisfied with their relationship when they had a choice in who they married. And that was compared to marriages that were arranged by their family or even by their friends. In Nepal, people who chose their partner showed higher relationship satisfaction, a greater sense of togetherness, and fewer disagreements. But it's important to keep in mind that Western ideas about marriage have changed too and they've shifted to becoming more a form of companionship uh, in which the emotional bonds are the highest priority. And we'll talk later um, also about what the expectations that uh, perhaps people used to have. Well, intimate relationships determine the survival of our species. And this goes back to Darwin's theory of evolution uh, that those of us who are alive today are a product of natural selection that random changes in genes uh, led to enhanced fitness. And fitness is measured by the fact that people have children who survive and reproduce. Um, yeah, and so you could think of romantic love as an adaptation. It's a commitment device that facilitates long-term pair bonding, if you want to think of it that way. MRI scans have shown that while you look at a picture of a beloved partner, it reveals activation in brain regions known to be stimulated when we receive a potent award or reward, and it deactivates uh, sadness and depression. Oxytocin is believed to be involved in sexual desire and romantic love, and it's a key element in the human neurobiological system. Uh, in experiments, when they give people oxytocin, uh, it causes them to see their partner as more attractive. It promotes feelings of calmness, sociability, and trust. And uh, that's partly by shutting down activation of the amygdala, which is, has to do with uh, emotion and the hypothalamus. Uh, and they also find that uh, people treat their partners with more kindness and less negativity. So what makes a relationship intimate? Couples need to have a define the relationship conversation, and they also need to provide clarification of what their expectations are. So one of the things that uh, intimate relationships are uh, is they show interdependence. And this is the mutual influence that uh, two people have over each other. And it's a defining relation or feature of any relationship. Now, interdependence exists between two partners in a relationship, and it's bi-directional. So we're defining our terms here. Interdependence is a necessary condition for intimacy, but it's not sufficient. And so, for example, as it has there, um, there's uh, relationships between a prisoner and a guard, and that's a bi-directional relationship, but it's not an intimate relationship. Um, and neither is the relationship between a store owner and a customer. So intimate relationships occur between two interdependent people who treat each other as unique individuals. And 
um, yeah, and so they have an in, uh, what an impersonal relationship is is a formal and task oriented um, relationship, and so it's impersonal because. For example, you may like the coffee shop barista who serves you coffee, but you're fine if someone else makes your coffee. It's kind of an interchangeable uh, kind of relationship. Whereas in personal relationships, uh, it's there's an informal, um, and the people engage at a deeper emotional level. So Kelly says that the close relationship is one of strong, frequent, and diverse interdependence that lasts over a considerable period of time. And he believes that closeness adds something to relationships. So the difference between close and intimate is where two partners experience a mutual erotic charge. Um, another way to think about this is that um, it could also be that they believe that there's a potential for them to be sexually intimate. So for example, a bromance, uh, which is an example that the book uses. I don't know if we still talk about bromances anymore, but that is not an intimate relationship. And similarly, one night stands and hooking up do not or constitute intimate relationships. So if we want a definition, an intimate relationship is characterized by strong, sustained mutual influence over a broad range of interactions with the possibility of sexual involvement. So you can see what the seven common attributes of love are. So desire, which is that you want to be united with that person physically and emotionally. Um, ideal, idealization, which is that you believe your partner is unique and special, that you're so happy that you found that person. Joy, meaning that you experience strong and positive emotions when you're with them. Preoccupation, you think about them when they're not there. Um, you think about maybe how they would react in a particular situation that you're going through. You might talk to them um, in your mind. Proximity is taking steps to maintain physical closeness or emotional contact to be with that person. Prioritizing, giving that relationship more importance than other responsibilities. So who comes first in your relationship? And caring, which is experiencing feelings of empathy and compassion. So love in intimate relationships has three main components, passion, intimacy, and commitment. Passion is love full of ardor and longing. Intimacy is a warm and comfortable feeling of attachment. Oh, I guess I should say. So passion is like when you're head over heels with, um, in love with somebody. Intimacy is like sharing and caring and knowing and being known and commitment is a decision to be in a relationship and a willingness to remain in it. And so this is like when you're forever and always through thick and thin, through better, for better or for worse. Sternberg says that there's different types of love um, in terms of different combinations of passion, intimacy, and commitment. So he says that romantic love is only passion and intimacy. And so there's no commitment. And so this is something like a summer fling where you know that there's an end point to it and it's not going to keep going. Uh, fatuous love is only commitment and passion um, and no intimacy. Uh, this is like a whirlwind uh, relationship where you get married in Vegas and then realize you don't really know each other at all and then you get a quickie divorce also in Vegas. And then companionate love is only intimacy and commitment without passion. And that's why there's a picture of older people there, because it's not like older people are jumping into bed every five minutes. Um, all three of those um, types of love result in consummate love. And so passion, intimacy, and commitment is the goal. So there have been studies that support um, his uh, Sternberg's um, distinctions. So intimacy and sexual passion accomplish different goals. And so in terms of love versus lust, thoughts of love direct gazes to faces, while thoughts of lust direct gazes to bodies, studies have found. Commitment is different from intimacy. So commitment is easy when things are good. Uh, the real test of commitment comes with rough times, when you're going through a rough patch or, or things aren't so good. 
Finally, intimacy, passion, and commitment develop at different rates. So intimacy tends to develop first and more rapidly. And then sexual passion rises, holds steady, and then declines. And commitment comes later, but increases with intimacy. So that's chapter one, and I hope you're having a great day.